So the next presentation, you're gonna hear about the Kidney Project and Implantable Artificial Kidney. Next slide. Our agenda is gonna look like this. We're gonna have our speaker and then we're gonna have time at the end of that presentation for Q and A. Uh, uh, during the presentation, feel free to drop any questions in through the chat. But at the end of the presentation, we'll, we will uh, review those questions as, and get through as many as possible. So I wanna introduce our first speaker. We have Dr. Roy. He is the professor at the University of California, San Francisco in the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences. And he is the director of the Biodesign Laboratory located on the Mission Bay campus. In addition, he serves as the technical director of the Kidney Project. Uh, welcome, Dr. Roy. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to sharing out what we're doing with the group. And I will start off by sharing what the ultimate goal of our work is. And as I get into this, let me sh share with you that I do not have internet access from my desk right now. I'm going over the phone, so I apologize. I'm not able to show you the animations and some of the details that I would otherwise have shared. Please uh, ask your questions in the chat. Follow up by email if you like. And if, we, if you'd like, happy to set up a time afterwards to go and get into details. So what you see on the screen right now is the vision that has driven our team to work over the last 15 to 20 years. So as many of you are familiar, you know, there's a severe shortage of transplant organs. And despite the knowledge that that's the best treatment out there, most of the patients have to rely on some form of dialysis. So we started off with a goal. How about if we're able to provide a device, a system that can provide continuous treatment as opposed to intermittent treatment, allow the patient freedom from being tethered to a machine, travel as they would like, remove the challenges of a through the skin connection, specifically infection risks and risks of blood clot due to chronic access through for PD catheter or hemodialysis catheter. Provide more physio physiological treatment than dialysis does. And if we could do this right and set the goal of not having immunosuppression or suddenly minimizing it, maybe this was a set of features would want in a desirable synthesized or synthetic device. And we call this the implantable bioartificial kidney. And what you see in the cartoon on the right hand side and in the middle is our vision for what this should be. This should work very much like a transplant kidney that combines a mechanical filtration unit, which we call the hemofilter with a cell therapy unit that we call the bioreactor. It's surgically attached to blood vessels located in the abdominal region and, can sit and has electronics and sensors to provide monitoring not just for the device, but also the patient. So let me just pause there and share that this vision that you're seeing here is driven by what do we want to provide these five features on the left. So the hemofilter is supposed to mimic the filtration component of our native kidneys, the glomerulus, while the bioreactor is intended to recapitulate the subsequent part of the kidney, the tubular sections, and the sensors is supposed to provide the monitoring and the autoregulation that's needed. Next slide. So some years ago, when we started this work, I was driven by the need to build something that recapitulates a kidney, native kidney altogether. But after talking with patients anecdotally and physicians and care providers, I would hear that maybe 
you do not need to achieve everything at once, but there's certain important features the device should have. And what I learned through a working with my colleague at UCSF was there's ways to determine what is really important in terms of quality of life and health by asking the group that will impact it most, the patients. So we worked with two groups, Home Dialysis United Ameri and the, the American Association of Kidney Patients to distribute a scientifically based survey to learn more about the benefit and risk considerations that patients may take into account if they're going to adopt a new technology, in this case, next generation renal replacement therapy. After surveying over 500 patients and analyze, they, analyzing this data, a couple of interesting things emerged. One was there was definitely desire for an alternative treatment because until we get many, many, many more, more transplants, we're going to rely on dialysis. But even then, it doesn't have to be everything at once, but patients really value mobility. The ability to travel, the ability to be not tethered to a machine. And what is interesting was that patients said, you know, would be willing to accept an increased level of risk if you could avoid going to the center three times a week and all the burdens associated with it. So this actually was enlightening to our team because it guided us in thinking about what do we need to focus on. Next slide. And this slide is it shows what we might want to focus on. So I show a table here that's got three columns and shows six primary functions that's provided by the kidney in our body. Toxin clearance, volume homeostasis means how much water, how much weight are you maintaining? The calcium phosphorus metabolism, making sure your bones are not dissolving away. Potassium regulation to make sure the heart's not being affected adversely. Red blood cell mass, basically meaning you're not anemic. And acid-base balance, making sure your blood pH, the acidity of your blood, is maintained. Our native kidneys do all these things, and they do them very elegantly. As, as you can see in the column for the native kid, kidney, dialysis attempts to do some of this through the machine and some of it by medications. And then what I propose on the very right-hand side is what the eye back should do. Now, going back to this idea of what do patients want and mobility and how can we get to that goal in a quick leap, in a quick enough manner, we thought, well, what are the where should we focus? And it turns out that except for the top two functions of toxin clearance and volume homeostasis, the rest of it can be achieved by medications or some lifestyle changes. So I've put a red box around toxin clearance and volume homeostasis because that's what you need a machine for. There are existing medicines that will let you do the bottom four and maybe not as conveniently as something that's totally automated as it's good, something as good as a transplant, but you can manage that. But what the machine doesn't do very well, uh, what you can do real well with medication is what you need a machine for, which is toxin clearance and volume homeostasis. So if you think in terms of what we may want to focus on is the minimum features of the machine that we develop, the minimum features of the device or the system we develop has to be toxin clearance and also making sure we provide enough in the volume balance. And I'll come back to what I mean by volume balance in a second. And if we're able to focus on this, we can get to a minimum viable product or a product that can impact the patient community in a much more 
readily achievable time frame than say purely basic science of trying to reverse kidney disease or growing a kidney in a petri dish from scratch. So next slide. So to approach this problem, we said we should take a fundamentally engineering approach. And what I mean by that is we do not need to wait on new discoveries to be able to deliver something that's going to provide the benefit. And what you see is a picture of the Mars rover. I show this because it's very sophisticated. It does take effort to build this, but there is no need to discover new physics to get this to Mars. And that doesn't mean it's trivial. It doesn't mean it's challenging, but what it does mean is that you can do it, and you can do it if you put the team and the resources to succeed. And that's fundamentally the basis of what an engineering approach is. I contrast this to a basic science approach where we may want to basically do this, wait for discoveries to happen, and you do experiments to do discoveries, and if the discover, many of the discoveries when they come about are the end result of many, many trials and uh, many trials that don't work out or fail. But when they do work out, it could be a big breakthrough. So that's, that's, that's another approach. And in the kidney community, there's a lot of work that's going on in the basic science, discovery science approach. Let's figure out a way how to reverse kidney disease. Let's, prevent, let's figure out a way, a magic pill that will, you know, stop the decrease in GFR. This is a discovery approach. Here, we're basically going to take the knowledge that's already out there. And yes, we have to improve it, as the people on the slide showed. They have to do it before they make a working rover. But ultimately, it's not relying on chance. It's relying on known variables. Next slide. And this is the approach you use to make medical devices that the FDA medical product industry is familiar with. So what is this? You start off by coming up with what are the needs of the user. In this case, it could be the care provider, it could be the patient, okay? You take those user needs and really listen. So that patient preference study I talked about two or three slides ago, that's exactly a type of engagement you need to get the right user needs. So you're building something that will be valuable for the user, in this case, the patient. So one is we want total mobility, but what does that really mean? Well, it means you have to be able to walk, walk around. So does it mean it sets the limit on the size? It sets the limit on how it should be located. So from the user needs, you get to get to design inputs. Okay, so we need something total mobility. It means it should be wearable or implantable. Then you, that's the design input. You keep doing that and you get to specifications on how much weight, how big can it be? So you go through the stage of you basically go and to design process, you design to the specifications you determine, you test them, and then you verify. There's a loop here, design input, design process, design output, verification. You do that, and at each stage you review this with the different stakeholders. At the end of it, you come up with a product, and then you go and back and check to see if it meets the user needs. This is the process that's used in making medical devices. Many of you are familiar with dialysis machines. And this is how they go about doing it. They may come to you and say, you know, what's a better, one of the challenges for your system? You can say, well, the vascular connections are not robust. That's a user need. Then the engineers at dialysis companies will go and work, or catheter companies will go and work and come back to you and say, okay, what do you think of this? That's the validation cycle. So we are going to use this waterfall design process to move forward in creating a device that's going to provide us the benefits that we proposed in that first cartoon slide. Next slide. So going through this exercise, we talked to a lot of stakeholders, patients, nephrologists, transplant surgeons, vascular surgeons, care providers, and some of the things that jumped out at us was that you really want something that's implanted because it allows, it provides 
total mobility without a concern for an external connection that could be a source of infection or could be a source of failure, mechanical failure. Well, if you're going to do that, you need to have a certain size. What's this? So you want to make it as small as possible, but you have to have a certain amount of function. So what's the largest size you could deal with? And as we talk, we just realize that, you know, the upper bound in size, which is a limitation of the technologies, is maybe about 500 to 750 milliliters, which is about the size of two cups. As the technology improves, maybe that would get smaller. But that certainly is something that a transplant surgeon said was reasonable for implantation. We asked this, well, how much clearance do you need to get? How much GFR do you really need to get? Obviously, healthy transplant, healthy kidneys, 100 milliliters per minute. But as many of you know, the morbidities don't really get accentuated until you get to 10 to 15 milliliters per minute. There are very many patients who actually seem to do okay with CKD3, CKD4 in terms of their quality of life. So if you can provide a quality of life with this device that mimics to start CKD3, CKD4, maybe that's the initial target you can work towards. So that's set a target for the urea clearance, for the technology that we can achieve in a reasonable time frame. So we said 230 milliliters per minute of GFR. That gets the patient off dialysis. Let the patient be able to travel and maybe drink and eat normally if you did not need lots of replacement fluid. For some of you who are good at math, um, which I'm not necessarily the, cap the same person, but if you do 20 to 30 milliliters per minute, that's about 30 to 40 liters of filtrate per day. Okay, 30 to 40 liters of filtrate. That means if you're going to pass that much out through your artificial kidney, you're going to be able to replace that. That's not practical by replacing by drinking. And it's not practical to carry around a bag either if we want to get total mobility. So we went and asked, what's the reasonable amount of oral fluid intake? And you've got numbers, yeah, you know, as much as some people said, even six liters. But often it's like one to two, three liters. So we said, okay, if we think about this device, let the device pass out up to three liters a day. That means the patient can drink three liters. And with this urea clearance of 20 to 30 milliliters, they would have the ability to maintain their volume, their weight. So we are now mimicking our native kidneys. We're filtering, and then we're, only, we're filtering 100 milliliters per minute. And if you do the math, that's about 150 liters a day of filtrate. But when you go to the bathroom, we're passing out one liter. So what happens to that rest of it is getting selectively reabsorbed such that the toxins, urea and others, are getting concentrated. So this is what these two, these two bullet points mean, is that we'll have a filter clearance rate, the equivalent of GFR, and the fluid excretion is the urine output. So you're producing 40 liters 30 to 40 liters of filtrate, but you're passing out two to three liters. So where's the rest of it going? It's getting reabsorbed very selectively by that second component, the bioreactor. And then the purpose of the kidneys obviously remove excess electrolytes and looking at what an average diet is, we basically set some numbers. Here's how much sodium ions, how much potassium ions, here's how much bicarbonate you need to get rid of per day. So this allowed us to come up with specifications that we could design to as our initial target for an implantable artificial kidney. So what I'm hoping that I'm getting to you is that we did not start off by saying, let's create all the functions of a kidney at once. Let us focus on things that are achievable and by do how do, what, what is important is let's find out what the needs are and desired attributes are from patients and care providers and others. And then let's come up with specifications. And then as engineers, we can work towards achieving these targets. So once we have this, the question is, well, is this 
I told you we're going to take an engineering approach. It means that some of the fundamental science of this must be around to build on. Next slide. And what we found out is there's actually a body of knowledge, a pioneer that has been working on kidneys treatments using combination of cells and mechanical devices. This is Dr. David Humes at the University of Michigan, who over 20 years ago was treating patients in the ICU who had acute kidney failure, the kidney failure you get due to trauma, due to sepsis, et cetera. And as some of you know, or many of you know, the standard treatment is ICU, intensive dialysis, giving your native kidneys a chance to rest and recover. He was treating these patients in the University of Michigan uh, Veterans Hospital. I know that despite the fact that many of these patients with AKI, acute kidney injury, were getting dialyzed three, four, five, six days in a row, many of them still died. And it's like, well, we're removing all the toxins. How come patients are dying? Many hypothesis, clearly we're not doing all the other functions of a kidney. So what he did was he took conventional, off-the-shelf dialyzer technologies, and he hooked it up, as shown in the picture on the right. Basically, connected the first one as a hemofiltration cartridge, took the output of the hemofiltration cartridge and passed it to the second cartridge, which was, again, the same device, but the lumens, the fiber lumen of the bioreactor cartridge was lined with kidney cells from a cadaver. So this is the architecture of our native kidneys nephron, the functional units in the kidneys. The first stage is getting blood, generating filtrate, very much like the glomerulus. That output is then sent to the second cartridge, which is lined with kidney cells, which mimics the tubule of the kidney. And he was doing this with the, to test the hypothesis that by providing more physiological ther therapy with kidney cells, you'd provide a benefit. And overcoming the challenge that just removing toxins by itself was not delivering the treatment that he had desired for his patients. So he worked on this in the late 90s uh, through a series of benchtop studies, preclinical studies, and he was able to get enough data that satisfied the FDA to authorize a clinical trial. Next slide. And what he did was he was able to take it to a clinical trial, and this system that he called the renal assist device, RAD, was tested in very specific sets of populations of AKI, but he was able to show that he could actually reduce the likelihood of death by over 50%. Think about that. Most of these patients otherwise are dying at 80, 90%. By incorporating the cells in this architecture, he was able to reduce the mortality by half. And this picture you see is actually the system. These are off the conventional dialyzer machines. There is a filter in it that I'm going to hemofilter that basically acts as a CRT filter. Then under the bubble wrap blanket is the other cartridge into which he had lined cadaver kidney cells. And this is a very much a very complex, complex system. And this little scale that you see in the middle with the little uh, beaker, that's collecting the output, the urine from the patient. But this in itself is working like a kidney because it's filtering and it's doing some of the tubular functions that a kidney does. And what struck me was that he had fundamentally shown the scientific basis for what this should be. But more engaging was the approach he took. Let's go to the next slide, which was not trying to do everything with a mechanical system, 
or not trying to do everything with a biological system, but took a hybrid approach. People have been trying to grow the kidney's native filter in the lab for decades, unsuccessfully, even till today. So what he did basically was, I'm going to take the synthetic dialyzer filter that you guys all are familiar with and use that as a blood filter. And I say, he basically built a filter because he could not grow the filter from cells. The second stage, which is the tubule, which is a very sophisticated component of the kidney, does a number of things that engineering by itself, synthetically using electronics technology or material science technology or the chemical engineering technologies, they don't really build a, tube to a system that captured all the functions of a tubule. So they said, I'm going to grow using cells what we don't know how to build. So I call this a biohybrid strategy. And the genius of his approach is that you can take all the advances that have come about in building the mechanical filter to perform the one function that kidney glomerulus does well, which is filter. You pass blood on one side, you push everything else that's below that and cut off into the filtrate with lots of water. The subsequent is the tubule that senses what's in the filtrate, and the cells automatically, because they're cells, do what they do in the native kidney, which is provide volume balance and some of the other functions. So this is the hybrid strategy that I think was attractive because the fundamental science of this was more or less established. Next slide. And this is the approach we have taken to move with the kidney project, which is take the lessons and the technology discoveries that was made two decades ago and bring engineering approach very much like the rover guys, Mars rovers guys do, and build something that's implantable that can provide the benefits that we desire, as I talked about in the first slide. So ultimately, this is what the goal of the work is. It is, you have to go through the design development process I shared a few slides ago. It has to be done carefully. It does require meticulous attention to detail. It does require resources. But ultimately, you're not waiting for a scientific discovery as much as you're waiting to get the work done carefully. And sometimes you have to, if it's not done carefully, you'll have to repeat. And that's part of the development cycle. But if you do this right, you can take what's on the left, the renal lipids device, and build something that goes to the right, which is totally implanted device. That has been the vision of what the patients and the care community desire. And that's the journey that's been for us for the Kidney Project. And I'll be happy to share with you as we go down and through for the Q&A about the you know, challenges and the successes we've had. So let's move on to the next slide. So the question comes is, how do you make things small? How do you take that that's very large and make it into very small? Small enough that can be implanted. So I look to the approach that has allowed miniaturization significantly, and that's what we're doing today. We're talking over the internet. We are using sophisticated communications devices, cell phones, computers. And as you know, computers in this 10 years ago to computers today, there's a big change in their function. They're smaller, they're more powerful, and cost-wise, they're probably even cheaper. You go back 50, 60 years ago, the computer was as large as a fridge, but didn't even have the power of a very old iPhone. So, but the infrastructure and the approach in semiconductor technology allows miniaturization to a significant extent, and when there's enough economics, you can actually make low unit costs. So we decided to pursue this approach of using semiconductor nanotechnology 
to miniaturize uh, our system. Can you go back one slide for a second? So when you look at this, a lot of the systems here are pumps, they're tubing, they are electronics. And you could suddenly bring miniaturization, make all kinds of approaches to bring everything smaller. But one thing that struck our team was that a lot of the pumping, tubing, they're all passing fluid through these two cartridges, the filter cartridge and the bioreactor cartridge. So in a way, the infrastructure, if you will, around the picture on the left is really monitoring and driving blood flow, fluid flow through the two dialyzer cartridges. And keep going to the next slide. And the next slide. And the, the epiphany for us was maybe what we should do is to focus on making those cartridges smaller and more compact. And if we make them more compact and more efficient, we could make them such that they require very low power. They actually work very much more efficiently than our own uh, polymer membranes that are used in cartridges. And they could be made at low unit cost. So what you're seeing here is our effort to miniaturize the dialyzer cartridge technology using semiconductor silicon, and we call it the silicon nanopore membranes, SNM. It's a silicon wafer. This is how you make electronics. It's a scanning electron micrograph of the geometry of the pores in the middle and to the right. These membranes have a high molecular selectivity. What does that mean? They can discriminate between small molecules and large molecules very precisely. They have a low fluidic resistance. What does that mean? It means they require very little driving pressure. In fact, so low that maybe we can just run off a battery or no battery at all. I'll get to that in a second. And you can make them using the same industrial manufacturing technologies used to make electronics. So there's a potential that once this is in production down the road, it will actually be cost effective and allow people not in this country only, but all over the world to be able to access the technology. Next slide. So this silicon nanopore membrane is worth taking a closer look. And I'm gonna to go to a little bit of engineering, but what you see is on the left-hand side is the cross section of a single hollow fiber that's used in a dialyzer. That's just part of the cross section. It's the cross sectional wall. It's about 34 microns thick. I'm going to round up to 35 microns thick. On the right, to, to the right of it is the silicon semiconductor membrane that we've developed. That's half a micron thick. And then if you look at the pores, the one on the left is the spongy structure, non-uniform. The one now on the right, the silicon is very uniform, parallel pores. So let's talk a, a little bit about this. The thickness difference means the resistance to fluid transport, resistance to blood flow, resistance to filtration is decreased. Very much if the long water hose and the pressure at the end of the long water hose is low, if a short, short water hose, the pressure is high. That basically means how much water you can get through at a given time. We use a, term, a, a, a parameter called hydraulic permeability as a measure of how much resistance you have. And what you basically see is that our, the membranes, our membranes have a much higher permeability than the standard polysulfone dialyzer membranes. And this translates into requiring very little driving energy for filtration. How low? so low that you can just use the blood pressure alone to drive the blood through the device and filter. Think about it. If we can just use the blood pressure alone, then we do not need batteries. If we don't need batteries, the device can be compact and doesn't run out when the batteries run out. So we, have, we envision a system that allows us to work just using the heart, pressure, heart and blood pressure alone, no need for mechanical pumps. On the right-hand side, I show a cartoon that shows the pore size distribution, engineering terms, but basically saying that our members have a sharp cutoff. We do not lose albumin. We remove all toxins, and our toxin clearance mimics the native kidney. 
just because we can control the geometry of the pores. So what I'm showing here is basically that our membranes have a sharp cutoff. Anything below the size of albumin will go through. Anything above, above the size of albumin will not go through. And the ones that go through are going to go through very efficiently. And like a polymer membrane where you might remove some of the larger toxins with poor efficiency, but you remove the smaller toxins with much more efficiency. That's what I mean by improved clearance. So next slide. And I'm going to not necessarily go into the details of this, but the point here is that we actually analyzed our membrane and showed that very small toxins go through. Nutrients like glucose and insulin can go through our membrane. But that's what this sieving coefficient basically is a measure of what goes through and what doesn't. 1.0 means the concentration on both sides is equal. And if nothing goes through, the concentration is close to zero. And we had no transmission of albumin. We had no transmission of antibodies. And in this particular experiment, we had a little bit of transmission depending on the membrane pore size of things like the cytokines that some of the other toxins, that uh, larger toxins that are seen in the body. But the point is, if you can make a membrane that does not allow the loss of albumin, that's a good thing. You do not want the patient to lose protein. If you can prevent antibodies from going through the membrane, well, if you can put cells on one side then maybe, and put it on, and implant it, maybe the body's immune system then will not attack the encapsulated cells. So opening up the possibility, we do not need anti-rejection drugs uh, in principle. Keep going. Next slide. And then we also looked at these membranes have to work with blood. <clears throat> Next slide. And so we ended up creating coatings that we can put on our membranes that prevent the deposition or absorption of fibrinogen or albumin. Why is that important? Because these proteins could deposit on the membrane in the filter. Not only could they cause the membrane to gunk up, and block filtration. But when you have fibrinogen and other proteins, it could begin the process of blood clotting. So we work at length to minimize the amount of absorption. And you can see on the right-hand side, I see the particular chemistry we've developed, PSBMA, PSBMA, which you apply to silicon. And you can just see that the amount of proteins that that absorbed is much less than the controls, which is unmodified silicon, or is this material called TCPS, which is tissue culture polystyrene, which is used in lab material all the time. The point here is that we can coat these membranes, retard the absorption of proteins that can block the filtration or cause clots. And what you see on the right-hand side are scanning electron micrographs of the unmodified silicon and the coated silicon after one month of being inside a pig. And you can see that, yes, there's some debris in the unmodified, but the coated membranes almost pristine. So we took this knowledge and said, let's make sure that we can actually build a filter and get some preclinical experience with this. So again, brought our transplant surgeons and vascular surgeons, brought our engineers and said, let's actually work out, can we actually run this as the way we've just posited in the previous slide? So I'll not go through all the details, but we built up a little CAD drawing and built up mock-ups, and we have been refining our surgical strategy. We can implant this under the skin or deep in the retroperitoneal region like a transplant. Just put the patients on aspirin-like treatments and have the device work. No need for blood thinners. So some of you who have uh, colleagues and friends, and some of you may be on blood thinners for implanted devices, you know the risks of that. So we say, let's see if we can design it so it does not run off any harsh systemic anticoagulants like Coumadin. And just using Plavix and aspirin-like therapies, we're able to show that for 30 days, we can have the device be pristine and operate. So again, a lot of engineering. Uh, we can do this by optimizing the blood flow. So just by having the right coding, make sure the blood is flow is laminar, we can actually design devices. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the device we built. This is the CAD drawing of the device. And we refine the surgical, you know, strategy that over time, we can get 30 days of continuous blood flow 
without using any sort of systemic anticoagulation. Next slide. And this is the optimization. You know the design iteration process? We are working with computational fluid dynamics. We're working with mechanical engineers. We're working with materials to optimize the design such that we can achieve laminar flow inside the device. Next slide. And we actually then implanted this in a pig, just the filter by itself. And in our lab, we have the standard protocol that it has to work for at least three days to meet the basic threshold that we've met our initial engineering spec. So it's, here's the device being tucked in and the ringed graphs that you see one is going to the best blood, they're going to the blood vessels, and the two other catheters are being tunneled and come outside, as you can see on the picture on the top right. So we can do dialysis and measure the clearance of the filter. And again, without blood thinners, you're just seeing that over the course of three days, we're able to remove urea, we will remove creatinine, but no loss of albumin. So we felt okay. That is a good starting point for a design and coating strategy for our filter. Next slide. We also then, in parallel, we're looking at how about the cells? Remember that our colleagues in Michigan have used cadaver cells. People said, well, maybe you should use stem cells. Maybe you should use animal cells. When we took into all that into account, we said our colleagues in Michigan had used human cadaver cells, and they got clinical experience with it to convince that the, the approach works. So we said, let us take the same approach. And the challenge with cadaver cells is that depends on the cadaver, depends on the health of the cadaver, that you know how good the cells are. And anyway, what this graph shows is that we can take a gram of cells from a, a cadaver kidney and we can grow them in the lab over and over and over again so that we can, in principle, use one cadaver kidney for tens of thousands of bioartificial kidneys. And what you're seeing here, the different colors of different donors. And in one particular case, the donor that's green was young and healthy, and they had, their cells are a lot more prolific than some of the others that you see, like the dark blue one. But the point is, we can grow kidney cells and use them. Now, can other cells be used? Absolutely, but this was the cell type that was authorized by the FDA for the clinical study. So we decided to stick with it. Next slide. We said, okay, let's take this idea. We've said we don't want immunosuppression. Can we actually take these cells and test the concept that we can create a bioreactor device that does not require immunosuppression and the cells are not attacked by the body? So we took human cells and created this little cartridge that you see. And go to the next slide. And we put it into a pig. And in this case, we put it into the, under the skin and we can monitor, so we can monitor the ultrasound. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side is after three days, just before we took it out completely, you're seeing the device. Each of the little squares, the gray squares, are where the kidney cells are, human kidney cells in a pig. The inflow is coming from one of the carotid vessels. It goes into the device, makes a U-turn, and comes out. Again, just being driven by the pig's blood pressure alone no batteries. The membranes are coated with those uh, polymers that prevent blood falling. We've optimized the geometry again so that the blood flow is laminar. By doing all this, we're able to flow the blood without blood thinners, and we put the cells in, and after three days, we took the device out. Next slide. And I want you to see how are the cells behaving despite the fact that they are pig was not immunosuppressed, no anti-rejection drugs. So I'm going to just summarize the data here, data here because not everybody will be able to follow it, but we looked at cells and their life, are they alive or dead? We call it viability. And we're comparing this with cells we have in the bench in the lab. In both cases, remember the cadaver cells, in one case, instead of pig without immunosuppression, the other case is in the lab, just in a little controlled environment. In both cases, cells were alive over 90%. Now, this is 90% in the pig without immunosuppression. So despite the fact that you have all this immune system of the pig wanting to kill these human cells, but the membrane 
provide that barrier. We also looked at are these cells behaving as they should in the kidney, and one of the parameters we looked at are they forming sheets of cells. That's what I know kidneys. There are sheets in the tubules that are rolled up in tubes. But here we're looking at sheets, and the bottom uh, picture on the left is basically showing that the cells grew in sheets, and they show something called tight junctions. This is very characteristic of healthy cells, as you see in the kidney. So the fact that the cells were alive, despite no immunosuppression, and had tight junctions, be, despite being grown in this artificial environment, was very, very exciting and promising for us. Next slide. So then we looked at how do the cells actually behave? So these are assays. These are tests you can do to see the health of the cell. So on the left-hand side, you look at something called NAG. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but basically it's a biomarker that shows if the kidney cells are damaged. In fact, when you go to the hospital and you have AKI, they look for this particular test to see how badly your kidney cells damaged. So we looked at the cells that were in the device, compared to the results on the outside, which was not exposed to anything, just pristine. And we found out that the implanted cells, implanted HREC, were just as good as the ones on the outside. Whereas the ones that were positively attacked by the chemicals that we stimulated them with, should a lot more expression of this NAG, six times in this case, than our implant itself. So our membrane was protecting our kidneys from being attacked. On the right-hand side, you actually analyzed the kidney cells that we got out and looked at the gene expression. The kidneys do a number of functions. Here we looked at the functions of water transport, something called aquaporin. This is what reabsorbs water. Maintains your salt balance sodium hydrogen exchangers, NH3, and then vitamin D production, which is what the proximal tubule segment of your kidney does. Again, relative to the controls on the outside that are not exposed and given the best condition, aquaporin, AK, AQP1, was about the same. Sodium transport was actually higher in that animal, and so was vitamin D production. And this is very interesting scientifically because you could say why, and it's, maybe it's because despite the fact that you're putting in the animal, which is a, with a different immune system, you're letting nutrients come in from the blood that maybe in the controlled experiment of the lab you don't get. Maybe that's why that's the higher. But the point is the cells are not worse off genetically than the ones that are in the control. And these are human cells in a pig. So this is very exciting. And then we said, okay, let's look at these cells a little more. Next slide. And I'll go through these. Next slide. Yeah. Um, I'll go through this somewhat fast. Let's see. Next slide. Okay, there you are. Uh, so here, I'm going to show that, you know, looking at these cells, uh, they do function as they should in the kidney. Because people have said, hey, you put these cells in an artificial environment, maybe they don't function as they should in a normal kidney. And what you're seeing is, you know, these cells shown on the left, the pictures under the microscope on the right, as a function of flow conditions. Most people who do research in chemistry labs and bio in you know, biological labs, just put them in a petri dish, or put them on a little well, and then monitor. What we found is that if we mimic the conditions of flow, as you have in the kidney, they do actually better, and that's what this is showing. This is showing that the cells can transport albumin uh, from one side to another. Next slide. Uh, this actually is a little more complicated, but it's basically showing that, again, the gene expression is a function of flow. Static means there just there's no flow, but if you have ultrafiltrate flow, in this case OSS stands for orbital shear stress, it produces an amount of mechanical shear on the cell. Very much like as in our kidneys, when you have the glomerulus filter, you have flow over the cells, and, but this basically shows that as a function of flow, the genetic expression improves. And that's what you'd expect, and that's what we see, and that's very also very exciting. Next slide. And then we said, okay, how long can we grow these cells, and can we grow these cells to be more tissue-like? On the left-hand side, we're able to show that by changing the stiffness of the coatings we put in our membrane for bio biology, they will, the cells will grow differently. So if you put a very soft coating, 
0 0.5 kilopascal, they grow one way. But if you make them and make it a little harder, they grow differently. And the very bottom is what people are used to seeing. The cells look like sheets, and this is how most people say, hey, this is great, uh, and we've got good cell growth. And that's what we see. What we stumbled on, though, and this is the graph in the middle, that showed that the change in the number of transporters of sodium do increase on the very, very soft substrates, the 0 0.5 kilopascal, when you keep them growing for more than four weeks. This is a counterintuitive result because 0 0.5 kilopascal is what our native tissues are. But all the research that's being done is done on materials that are about the 40 kilopascal. And what we stumbled on is, hey, if you let it grow long enough, you actually do better and mimic the kidneys, native kidney. And yeah, this is a discovery we made, and obviously other people are also building on this. But we've been able to take this work as long as almost a year and show that cells still maintain the kinds of structure that you see on the right-hand side. Again, 11 months to 12 months in the lab, we can do that. So this gives us promise that, yes, it is very possible to make these cells to be alive. Next slide. And I'm going to go fast here, basically showing that we can, next slide, we're going to go and we can transport water. Not only can we transport water, but the transport of water. You know the concentration? We filter a lot, but we have to reabsorb much of it back. That's what this is getting at. So we have to filter 20 to 30 milliliters per minute, but we have to reabsorb much of that back to have electro, electrolyte balance. This is showing that by changing the amount of drugs, you can actually modulate the amount of water that's transported. In this case, about 13 liters per day per square meter of surface area. Next slide. Uh, we know that this is not the end. We can actually improve this. So the lab experiments we're doing is optimizing the water transport. In this case, we're looking at a different type of cell, a pig cell, and it's showing that, hey, by changing the drugs you expose the cells to, by changing the flow rate, the shear you apply these cells to, you can go as high as 70 liters per day per square meter. Why, did, why is that important? This, you know, about a half a square meter of surface here is something you can readily pack into an implanted device. So now we're getting the close area of this minimum specs we wanted to target. So we're able to generate a lot of fluid through filtration, but much of that can be reabsorbed. So if you're filtering out 40 liters and we can we absorb, say, 35 liters. The patient only has to take five liters of intake. If you increase that by optimizing it more, maybe one to two liters. That's what this is getting at. Next slide. So after some time, we said, okay, let's take stock of all this knowledge we have. And people are continuing to refine this, but let's just see if our original desire holds up. So we took the knowledge I've shared with you, created a prototype cartridge of a filter and a bioreactor, and connected them very much in the same architecture as Dr. Humes did in Michigan. So the first part is a filter. It takes blood in and then generates ultrafiltrate that goes to the second section, the bioreactor that's lined with kidney cells. And go to the next slide. And this is our first attempt at putting it into, the, into a pig subject. And you can see the bioreactor on the right and the hemofilter, the two graphs that go into the iliac vessels, very much like a kidney transplant is done. The purple catheter is going to the bladder, and that's basically where the urine comes out. Next slide. And what we did was in this initial experiment, in three days, we were able to show that we are creating urine in the filter, that's the four microliters per minute, and at the and going to the bladder was 0 0.3 microliters per minute. So what's the difference? It's getting concentrated. The toxins are getting concentrated into the 0 0.3, meaning that much of that is getting reabsorbed very much like our native kidneys do. And this is exactly what we'd want to see. A lot of filtration, concentration to a very small amount of urine. In this case, these numbers are minuscule, but the concept is exactly what our native kidneys do. Now, remember, Humans did milliliters per minute of urine. Um, here, this is the proof of concept, is just showing that you can generate filtrate and much of it gets reabsorbed and the cells are alive and there's no blood clot. So I'm gonna wrap up here by saying what you've shown is a proof of concept. This approach 
Next slide. Worth, where we can take the concept of, yeah, where we can take the concept of what do patients care about, which is mobility, totally implant device, and create a proof of concept by do, taking an engineering approach where we optimize technologies and demonstrate feasibility of your end. And so what we have shown, hopefully today, is this approach of a hybrid strategy of combining a mechanical filter with cell therapy can get to a functional device that then needs to be improved on to provide the kinds of volume we need to keep a patient alive. So I'll wrap up by saying this is an ambitious project, next slide, and it requires a lot of support. And my colleague here from the University of, uh, from Vanderbilt University is a nephrologist who has been single-mindedly focusing with me on how to get this device advanced towards patients. And then obviously we work with lots of groups to advance this work, uh, including federal agencies, but more and more importantly, we rely on philanthropy because we're at that stage where we are beyond the scientific proof of concept, but we're not yet ready for industry. So we have to move this forward to build a larger scale device that can show we can actually keep a pig alive when its kidneys are not functional. And that's our goal going forward. Once we do that, then we can think in terms of going back to the FDA and talking about the first clinical study. So thank you, I'm happy to take questions. I know they've been coming in. If uh, somebody wants to read them out for me, I'm happy to take this. If I do not get to your questions now, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'm sure the organizers will also send me the questions I can respond to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roy. There has been a lot of um, just questions and comments really just in the, in the um, chat, uh, a, a lot of just really good information, good stuff. Of course, everybody wants to know, I think you just answered, wants to know when the clinical trials are, has it been tested on a human yet? And that sounds like this is still to come. So, um, that is correct. Let me just wrap. So yeah, it's a question that a lot of people ask and many of you and will ask and many of you who have patients uh, want to know. So um, it is not yet at humans. Uh, and the question, when it gets to humans, I think it comes down to how fast we can get this next set of iterations done. So we've shown mil microliters of urine. We need to be able to get milliliters of urine. And that requires us to scale the device with more surface area for the silicon membranes and more kidney cells to perform the bioreactive function. And so what does scaling up mean? It means that you gotta make more wafers for membranes and make the cells. So it is a lot of industry scale up, if you will, but not always has to be done in industry, but it's basically scaling up. There's challenges in scaling up uh, techn technologically, but can be done uh, as we know from other treatments like CAR-T, for example, uh, but also it's a question of the resources we can bring to the project over time. So that's the other part that limits us. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just looking real quick, just that wonderful, wonderful uh, explanation. The photographs were a great visual and um, glad to hear about advancement in the artificial kidney development, I, I agree. So I think that's um, overall. Uh, oh, how long did the pig live? That was an important question. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I think the pig, <laughs> I think the question is, you know, how long the pig live? These are healthy pigs. We do not take the cadaver kidney. We do not make them anephric because we do not have enough capacity. So the longest we've done, this particular one that created urine, we only had it for three days. That's our sort of standard assay. But we've had silicon membranes inside pigs as much as a month. And the month is basically an arbitrary decision in the terms of logistics of, and resources to keep the pig alive. But we've kept them still, the pigs alive with silicon membranes as long as a month. Uh, and we feel like it can go longer if we provide the right sort of support and logistics for it. Okay, great. 
In terms okay. of, let me just wrap up by saying, what would daily yeah. living with, the, with this device look like for a patient? I think the way I would think about that is when this device gets to a patient, the patient should be able to eat and drink normally. We should not have to worry about, especially fluid intake, because I think that will be addressed. Uh, they'll be able to travel. Uh, will they still need medications? For example, at least this initial version, EPO, yes, because the cells we've put into this first version are proximal tubule cells, so will not make EPO, but the patient will need EPO. But over time, as we develop next generations of the technology, I envision different types of cells, so eventually you'll actually need, you'll be able to produce EPO, for example. Great. Well, very good. Uh, this was, yeah, very interesting. I know that this um, request specially came from our patient groups. They really wanted to hear about what was happening within innovations with around the ESRD. So we are very fortunate to have you. We appreciate you coming on today. Obviously, very busy schedule. So uh, thank you so much again and uh, take care. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.